Who are the worst types of kids in high school? Is it ghetto girls? Hoop earrings, fake nails, head movements like a rooster when they're upset? Usually called white names, just pronounced poorly? No, it's Stephanie. Talks trash about other girls' hair when hers looks like she got it from my autistic pony. Thinks they're hot sh when the only thing flaming is that allergic to latex cooter. Is it Discord mods? Kids with an overly inflated ego from having the tiniest bit of power. They think they're cool when they're really just an Uncle Tom for a successful YouTuber. Jay Schlatt doesn't ask twice. Okay. Okay. Is it the gym rat? First kid you've ever seen with back knee. Refuses to tilt while walking through the hallway. Grunts while working out to let you know who's the alpha. <laughs> Is it the teacher's pet? You know the kid that raises their hand at the end of class to tell the teacher she forgot to sign homework? I mean, have you ever wanted to bully a kid more? How dare you make it so I have 15 minutes less to play Minecraft? But homework will help us learn. No. You're about to learn today, sweet cheeks. Is it my first facial hair? The kid that thinks he's a man because he can now grow a few whiskers above his lip. Thinks he looks like Zac Efron when he really looks like get in the back of the van, John. Is it bullies? The kids who pick on others in order to deflect from their own insecurities. Remember, they're not beating you up for being gay. They're just trying to beat the gay out of themselves. Is it the person most likely to join a cult? You know the people that idolize a narcissist whose only goals are money, power, and to sleep with underage girls who keep a secret? These kids just want a community to belong to, which comes at the low cost of their silent obedience. Is it pork chops? The greasy walrus-like creatures that have completely given up on their bodies. Tells people body shaming is wrong, asks you use the elevator during fire drills, gets upset when only one butt cheek fits in their chair. These kids are barely even people. Uh, they're basically just flesh vacuums for overprocessed food. Is it the artsy kids who create gorgeous pieces of art that will later be stolen by AI programs? These guys are like Heath Ledger. They have tons of talent, but they're too busy sleeping. Is it the army recruit? The kid that judges what women do with their bodies while simultaneously letting the government decide what's done with his. Talks about made-up threats to our country like wokeism and CRT while disregarding the military-industrial complex. Convinces himself he's not a scared teenager who doesn't know what to do with his life and is just looking for someone to make decisions for him. No! No, it's just I love America too damn much! Is it the Butterface. The girl that would be a 10 if it wasn't for that Down Syndrome Bella Ramsey face. You go from hard to flaccid every time she turns around. Your guy friends bust your chops for hitting on her. The only thing you care about is busting on her chops. Is it the overachiever? The kid in multiple honor classes, sports, and clubs. Also known as the kid with Asian parents. They're always studying for exams like their life depends on it. Because in many ways, it does. Is it the secretly racist kids? Listens to Tucker Carlson. Calls anyone that disagrees with them sheep. Favorite phrase is I'm not racist, but... Always mentions our culture is at stake. When what they really mean is there's a few new black people in town. What is happening to America? Is it the shy 10? The quiet girl that doesn't realize she hit the genetic lottery during puberty. Her fun bags are at max and her trunk is so big when she sits down, she gets taller. She tends to keep to herself, which is perfect because that means less competition. Now is the time to make offhanded comments about her appearance that will result in years, if not decades, of unresolved insecurities. Hey, your dimples are really big. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, it's not a bad thing. It's just... Odd. Lower her already low self-esteem so she feels like you're the best she can do. Is it the student who brags about sleeping with a teacher? Kids can't keep a secret, let alone one as juicy as Pork and Miss Sullivan. Now sure, she's a pedo who deserves to be tarred and feathered, but I'm not gonna tell my homie that. Why give him childhood trauma that will impact all of his future relationships when I can give him high fives instead? Is it that kid that died drinking and driving? You know the kid that used to bully you, now everyone's pretending is a saint? Halo around his portrait at the funeral? Really? 11 shots of Jaeger driving 100 miles an hour with no seatbelt and that's God's choice? Chosen child? Okay. Now, like Muslims on 9-11, you gotta pretend to be sad when you're really just fighting the urge to giggle. Is it special ed kids? You know the kids that can't take a piss without biting their own tongue? They're always disrupting class at inappropriate times. Everyone, I know today is gonna be tough knowing Billy died in a drinking and driving accident, but it's important we get through this together. Is it the talentless influencer? The kids who have no discernible talent and just react to other people's creativity. Also known as sniper wolf simps. Did I accidentally give out the home address of an individual I've convinced my fan base is trying to ruin my career? Whoopsie. Is it the class clown? The kid who brings joy and laughter to an otherwise boring geometry class. Willing to take all the punishment from the teacher just to entertain the masses. The OG homie who for a brief moment in time makes you forget about ending yourself. You are lucky to even be in a room with them, you talentless monkey! Is it the gossip queen. Girls whose sole purpose is to talk shit about others. You see, gossip is like currency in high school. And the more life-ending a secret is, the richer you are. Don't believe me? Imagine finding out Stacy gave a blowy to the basketball coach. Yeah, you don't think you'd have a little power over her life after that? Uh, what I'm really saying is, we all know mental warfare is worse than physical, right? So in a way, these gossip biddies are mental serial killers. Is it the kid that always uses the term cringe? Has no discernible talent and broadly uses the term cringe for anything he doesn't like? You know the kid that doesn't take any creative risks and just shits over other people? people's hard work. I have a dream.
Ugh, cringe. Is it the overdosers? The kids with dark circles under eyes were slowly developing Parkinson's. Only talents are finding a vein and sharing with others. Is it the token black kid? You know the one black kid in an all-white school? Has to deal with people saying he's not black enough or acts too white. Mom is a pharmacist for CVS and dad gets angry sometimes. Is it the Adderall junkies? The kids that were given a 50 milligram stimulant because their parents were too lazy to talk to them. Eyes look like they popped E. Can't stop going to the bathroom. Doesn't hide when there's a school shooter because they're too busy focusing on the sweat bead going down Miss Sullivan's chest. Is it tech support? The kid you go to whenever you get viruses in your computer from watching too much Teen Titans corn. Yo, you really like Starfire, don't you? Listen, how about you fix my computer before I have to explain to my sister what post-nut clarity is? Is it the rich kid who doesn't think he's rich? Drives a brand new BMW to school? Tries to relate to your problems, but is so out of touch with the struggle that he just comes off as pretentious? Dude, I... I think I have to go back to the foster home. Bro, give me a sec. I'm fighting Vin Diesel if he was the size of a baby. Woo, this AI stuff is getting wild. Is it the prankster? The kid that releases three pigs into school with the numbers one, two, and four on them just for the lols. Is it the kids who always talk in internet slang? No cap, bro be simping over my drip. That boomer just be jelly that your riz be fire, fam. You know, you both use a lot of lingo for I'm not getting laid. Is it the smart kid who never applies himself? Brags how he aces every exam despite never studying. Thinks life is going to be as easy as high school, but falls into a deep depression by age 23, develops a substance abuse problem and eventually realizes ignorance is bliss. Is it the ghost? And no, I'm not talking about the secretly racist kid. I'm talking about the kid who's always disappearing from school, only showing up when there's a test, pizza party, or fight. Since Stacy is pregnant, does that make this a two-on-one? Is it the screw-ups? The kids that are always screwing up their lives. All the opportunities in the world and their brain is like, ah, time to ruin this. Is it the wildlife enthusiast? Spends most time outdoors, thinks shaving is unnatural, feeds wild deer around campus, secretly hopes to get humped to death by a dolphin. I'm just glad you're happy. Is it the horned up athlete who you're pretty sure joined the wrestling team so he has an excuse to get handsy? You want to call him out, but you're too afraid of being labeled a bigot, even though you're pretty sure ball tickling isn't a pin technique. Is it my first couple? You know the two kids that are mainlining the most powerful drug of all? Love. Nothing will make a person dumber than being in love. Rationality is not blowing you, so it's out the window. At first, you'll think these kids are cute, but very quickly move to get off my fucking locker. Oh, Becky, you could at least wipe first. Is it the kid who's cool with everyone, but close to no one? They're like trash cans. They're everywhere, but no one ever thinks about them. Is it the letdowns? The kids you think have your back, when really, they got their own problems to worry about. So those are all the worst types of kids in high school. If you like this madness, check out my other worst kids in high school video, where I go even harder. You're gonna have to take one if you wanna make it. Ooh, I, <laughs> I love it when you cry. Special thanks to my homie Tokemon for collabing on this one. And just remember, J Schlatt doesn't ask twice. Titties. Big floppy titties. Whether you're gay, straight, whatever Sam Smith is, everybody loves titties. But how do you get your mitts on a pair of fun bags? Well, in this video, I'm gonna give you seven steps on how to touch your first booby. Step number one, hide your boner. You see, when you're young, you'll be getting a lot of NRBs or no reason boner, where you get rock hard even when you're not thinking of anything sexual. And you can't be walking around with a throbbing Dwayne the Cock Johnson. So how do you get rid of a stiffy? Well, you could think of your grandma rubbing mayonnaise on her inner thigh, but that's still gonna take a minimum of 30 seconds and you don't got that kind of time. So instead, you're just gonna have to use your pants. Just stick your beaver basher up through your waistband and choke that shit like it's Epstein in a prison cell. Step number two, try not to be creepy. When you're horny, it's like there's a cloud in your brain and you don't think correctly. As Robin Williams once said, God gave man a penis and a brain, but unfortunately not enough blood flow to run them both at the same time. So try your absolute hardest not to look at their tits. You see, boobs are like the sun. You can only stare at them directly for a few seconds, but if you put on sunglasses, you can stare at them as much as you want. Step number three, wardrobe. Even if you look like Post Malone's virgin cousin, a simple well-fitting outfit can make you look like a million bucks, maybe even a billion. And even if you're not up to date on the latest fashion trends, I got you covered with some simple go-tos. First, make sure your outfit fits correctly. Baggy shirt may feel comfortable, but it screams you got bigger tits than her. Next, get yourself a pair of white sneakers. Is white the dumbest color a sneaker could be? Of course. But women aren't into practical things like cargo pants or honesty. They're into fake things. And what's faker than pretending you need to use the bathroom just to scrub the puddle stains your new kicks. Lastly, you need some accessories, whether it's a watch, sunglasses, lowercase t necklace, whatever. Something that makes you stand out in a crowd. Just whatever you do, don't buy designer clothes. Buying a Gucci belt is like saying GG's to your wallet. Step number four, approach girls. Easier said than done, I know. But at the end of the day, people always appreciate when you approach them. It shows confidence. You could sit around all day imagining what your life could be like together, or you could grow a pair and start a conversation. Easiest way is just to talk sh whether it's talking sh about your surroundings. Is that the new iPhone? Damn, the 
sweatshop kids work hard. Their appearance. Why do your shoes say k -k 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 all over them? Or talking shit about others. Do you think Mr. Murphy's a pedophile? What? No. Then why did he write D on my paper and ask to see me after class? I think he's gonna try something. Step number five, tease. Women love to be teased, but don't go too hard in the paint. Making dead baby jokes right after the miscarriage might come off a little insensitive. Just start small. Like if she's wearing cowboy boots, give her the nickname cowgirl. Or if she says something sweet, call her sugar tits. Just try to make her feel comfortable. Then move the conversation to be more sexual related. Again, don't start with, what's your thoughts on tossing salad in the morning? Work the conversation there slowly. Then once you develop a rapport, it's time to move on to step six. Get them to a different location. This might be the most important step. You need to move from school friend or work friend to just friend. You see, friends can hang out anywhere. And it's a lot easier to make a move in the bleachers rather than on the field. Just try to be casual about it. You don't want it to seem like a date. Again, women don't want honesty. They want plausible deniability in case it doesn't go well. What? I just thought he was being nice walking me to my car. Okay, I guess we're kissing now. <laughs> Step number seven, initiate physical contact. And no, I'm not talking about a surprise titty grab. Do something cute like grabbing her hand while walking through a crowd or show off your fingering skills by having a thumb war. Once the physical barrier is broken, it'll make her feel more comfortable with you and increase the chances of intimacy. Uh, either that or she'll file sexual assault charges against you, ruining your reputation and any future job prospects. It's a gamble, I know, but remember, you're always one laugh away from either motorboating or being charged with groping. So those are my tips on how to honk your first pair of fun bags. Probably weren't the tips you were expecting, but they're the tips you deserve. And just remember, even if she says no, you still have options. Kidnapping? What? Uh, no. Uh, no. Paying for it. Make these bitches do it. Cheating has made my life way better. When I was in elementary school, what I used to do is put my hand on my forehead and just cheat off everyone's paper. It was a simple and flawless strategy. The trick is you basically just tilt your head to the side and basically rub your forehead like you're thinking when you're really just scoping for answers. Every once in a while, the teacher would say, everyone keep your eyes on your own paper. But even as a child, I'm like, bish, prove I was cheating. Now, normally, I would just do this for a few answers I wasn't sure about. But in fourth grade, we had an exam to get into the gifted and talented program. I had no idea what it was, but it sounded nice. So I'm like, oh, I gots to be cheating for this one. So I brought one of my smart homies with a bag of Jolly Ranchers. I'm like, all you gotta do is keep your Scantron visible. And he's like, mm. Alright. This worked perfectly, and in middle school I was accepted in the program, which was by far the greatest class I've ever taken. The structure wasn't sit there and have some middle-aged woman lecture you. No, it was here's a problem, get together in groups, and figure out how to solve it, leading it to feel more like play and less like school. One of the assignments was develop an invention that would help mankind. And after a week of scribbling down terrible ideas, I was like, wait, I'll just do what got me here, and cheat. So I stole an idea from The Simpsons, where Homer develops a chair that prevents you from falling backwards. I didn't even change the idea, I literally just drew out the same shit and had my mom make me a prototype. My teacher ended up liking the idea so much, she chose me to represent our school at an invention fair. Which meant one, I could potentially win prizes, and two, more importantly, I get the day off of school. So I go to the fair, and it's in this beautiful, all-white high school. How did I know the demographic was white? Because it had a goddamn planetarium in it. Yeah, try finding that in the inner city. That's right, there was an entire room dedicated to looking at all the grandness of the universe right next to my first DJ. And while waiting for the judges to come around, I went to one of the shows. Which was incredible. Not because it gave me perspective, that we're all just stardust filled meat bags given enough rationality to realize our own mortality but because it was hilarious you see the presenter used a laser pointer to show different constellations and star systems but some kid also brought a laser pointer and during the show just started circling random things which caused the presenter to get furious she's like whoever's doing that stop it right now and I'm just dying laughing which causes other people to start laughing which causes the presenter to turn on the lights and cancel the show I'm like this day is already incredible and knowing my classmates are stuck in school right now is only making it better. So I go back to my booth and eventually two judges come over. They ask me questions about my invention and I bullshit my brains out. I'm like, oh well, many kids get bored and lean back in their chairs, so I just thought of a way to ensure their safety, blah 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 blah. A few hours later, everyone gathers in the auditorium for awards. There were five prizes to give out and I ended up winning three of them. Two were $50 gift certificates and one was a $300 stereo system. I was so freaking happy. And not even so much from the prizes, but the fact I was standing in front of a crowd of people that were cheering me. Because remember, I'm 11 years old. Nothing Nothing special had ever happened to me by that point. And now, I'm winning three out of five prizes in an auditorium full of jealous kids. Mmm, it was tasty. The only person happier than me was my mom. She damn near lost her shit when I told her on the phone. And being an entertainer, I made sure to build the excitement. I'm like, hey mom, so they just handed out prizes, and I won a $50 gift certificate. And she's like, oh, that's wonderful. I'm sorry, did I say a $50 gift certificate? I meant to say two. 
$50 gift certificates. And she's like, whoa, you won two prizes? And I'm like, wait, did I say two $50 gift certificates? I meant to say two $50 gift certificates and a $300 stereo system. And she's like, what? And the praise didn't stop there. The following day at school, my teacher is parading me around like little Steven crushed it at the invention fair. Behold, his enormous brain, you dumb peasants! And I'm just waving like Miss America, like, thank you. Thank you, I was born with a gift, thank you. Every once in a while, a student would come up to me and be like, hey, you stole that idea from The Simpsons. In which I'd reply, I'm sorry, where's your $300 stereo system? Oh, that's right, I'm gonna call you Smuckers, cause you're being ultra jelly right now. So overall, what this experience taught me is, cheaters always prosper. It got me into a class where I could flex my creative muscles, it got me a day off of school, it got me a free comedy show, it won me prizes, it made my parent proud, and it got me what I wanted most of all, attention. So the lesson you should take from this video is, cheat in school. And it doesn't have to be the hand on the forehead strategy. It could be writing your answers on a small piece of paper, or checking your cell phone in the bathroom, or blackmailing your teacher when you find their OnlyFans. It doesn't matter so long as you're not studying, because life doesn't reward hard work. It rewards exploiting other people's hard work. My grandmother once told me all of God's creatures are precious, which is just bullshit. Leeches are precious, ticks are precious, cockroaches are precious. Face it, some animals deserve to die. So let's talk about seven animals that need to be exterminated. Starting off with pandas. Pandas are like the Down Syndrome kids of the animal kingdom. If left to their own devices, they would kill themselves almost instantly. Pandas spend 16 hours a day eating bamboo, they're constantly falling off of sh and they don't even know how to f do you know that zoos will use panda porn to try to get them to mate? Like, how do your own survival instincts not tell you when it's time to smash? And even if they do pork, good luck getting pregnant. Their average penis size is three centimeters. Three centimeters! Lady Gaga's dick is bigger than that! And females only ovulate a few days a year, so there's no guarantee that they'll even get pregnant. And even if she does get pregnant, that baby's probably dying. Panda babies are born blind, are one nine hundredth the mother's size, and require feeding every two hours. Face it, the only reason why these creatures are still alive is because we spend out outrageous amounts of money on them. The U.S. spends five billion on panda conservation every year. Think about it, for that kind of money, you could give 25,000 kids with cancer a Lamborghini Huracan. Have them live their final day plowing into a tree, rather than looking at one on a wall. Next up, polar bears. We've all seen that image of a polar bear stuck on a small piece of ice as some liberal tries to convince you that global warming is real. Says who, an earth scientist? What the hell do they know about the earth? And even if it was real, we should all be happy it's killing this arctic demon. But they're so cute. No, they're not. They're monsters with a good publicist. Why don't they show you pictures like this? Or this? Or this? If you love polar bears so much, why don't you rescue one? Keep one in your backyard and finger cross it doesn't mistake you for a baby seal. Polar bears are liars too. You know they're not actually white? Underneath their fur, they have black skin. And if Fox News taught me anything, that's how you know they're bad. Next up, alligators slash crocodiles. Contrary to what you might think, dinosaurs still roam the earth. And like most fossils, they're typically found in Florida. Now we all know Florida is the dick of America. And right at the tip is a massive area of swamplands known as the Everglades, or what I like to call redneck Jurassic Park. This place is infested with alligators and crocodiles, and they are not an animal you want to f**k with. Crocodiles can be as big as 23 feet, have the jaw strength of 3,700 pounds, and can run 20 miles an hour. If one wants to eat you, just flash your neck and hope it's over quick, because you stand no chance. With all that said, some Floridians, also known as inbreds, still want to mess with them, treating them like Democrats and giving them free handouts. Ah? Uh, you get it? Handouts? I know some of you don't appreciate my off-handed comments, but that was hands down my best joke. <laughs> Knuckles. Next up, mosquitoes. Unlike some other animals on this list, most would agree this one's pure trash. Mosquitoes are the deadliest animal on the planet, killing over a million people a year. How do they do it? Well, first they spit on you, like a Boston fan at a Yankees game. Then they penetrate you without your consent. My body, my choice, you pint-sized Cosby. If Hitler made his life goal to exterminate mosquitoes instead of Jews, he would have statues named after him, and not just a Kanye clothing brand. But what can you do when there's trillions of mosquitoes? Well, Bill Gates has an answer. That's right, when he's not putting critical race theory in vaccines, Bill funds a company that genetically modifies mosquitoes. And if the first half of Jurassic Park taught me anything, it's that nothing will go wrong altering the DNA of animals. So how do these genetically modified mosquitoes work? Well, first, they John Mayer their way through the population, mating with as many females as possible. Then, their magic splooge does the rest, making it so no female offspring will survive to adulthood. So move over, Lizzo. There's a new animal literally f***ing itself to death. Next up, 
love otters. You probably think this animal's cute, huh? Whether it's their hand holding, rock juggling, or the fact they squeak when they touch water for the first time. But otters are really disease ridden corpse fuckers. They are not great animals, as some unshaven liberals will have you believe. They are merciless hell spawn who use their intellect for great evil. Don't think so? Well, let's just look at the otter rape chart. Male otters rape female otters, typically holding their heads underwater while biting their face. They rape baby seals, sneak it up on them when their mothers are occupied. They rape pet dogs, probably while whispering in their ear, who's a good boy? And to top it all off, they also rape dead otters. Yeah, you heard me. Male otters have been known to have sex with dead female otters. Horrible, I know. You know what else is horrible? Male otters will also hold their babies hostage in order to try to get food. Bro, imagine trading your infant for a Big Mac. And to top it all off, when fighting, male otters will bite down on their opponent's penis. Dude, I've gotten into some scuffles in my life, but if someone tried to bite my dick off, then I'm literally John Wicking their entire family. Next up, koalas. This might be the dumbest animal on this list. They have one of the smallest brain-to-body ratios of any mammal. The only thing they eat is eucalyptus leaves, which has almost no nutritional value, and the only reason they know it's food is because it's in a tree. If you took those same leaves and laid them flat on a table, the koala wouldn't recognize it as food. They're too stupid to adapt their feeding behavior to cope with any change. In a room full of potential food, they would literally starve to death. That's like taking the top bun off a sandwich and being like, where did my BLT go? But they're not just simple-minded, they're also disgusting. Like most mammals, koalas feed their babies, called joeys, milk. When transitioning from milk to eucalyptus leaves, the joeys frequently will not have enough gut flora to handle the digestion. To solve this, the babies will literally suck on their mother's anus until she excretes a fecal pap. So just to clarify, baby koalas go ass to mouth on their own family. Kill it, kill it with fire. Also, side note, three-fourths of them have chlamydia, so if your girlfriend gets suspicious, just blame it on a petting zoo. And the last animal that needs to go extinct is, you guessed it, the Kardashians. With a genus species name of Fakus cuntus, these creatures have infested our lives long enough. They have no discernible talents, they shit on the self-esteem of young girls, and their only nourishment is by suckling on the teat of publicity. When not given enough attention, some have even evolved to a more hideous creature. So how do we stop them? We could pray, but God seems busy laughing at kids with cancer. I guess our only hope is to just ignore them. But with our luck, they probably just come out with another sex tape. Be hard not to watch Kylie get blasted by the whole Lakers front court. That's a lot of balls to her face. Why God? Why did you do this to my face? Is a question we've all asked ourselves. But if you were born ugly, you still have options. So here's seven ways to fix being ugly. Number one, your teeth. If your teeth are reminding everyone of your British ancestry, then it's time for Invisalign. Only the problem is it can't make your teeth whiter. And if anything says you're rich, it's hitting women and getting away with it followed by white teeth. Now, you could bleach them, but like the letter community, they'll turn ultra-sensitive. That leaves you with only one good option, veneers in Tijuana. I'll hook you up my lady, Dr. Alejandra. She did an amazing job, and my teeth are now gorgeous. Use my promo code FETUSDELETUS for 5% off your next smile. Number two, your nose. If you have a large nose, it's probably because God hates you and wants to cast a shadow on anyone in your presence. Seriously, what are you sniffing, Paw Patrol? Is there a stinky cooter nearby you're trying to warn us about? What's that smell? Is that you, Becky? Are you upset because the most dangerous part of a motorcycle is now the helmet? When you carpet munch, is that also intercourse? Jokes aside, what can you do about your parrot beak? Well, aside from surgery, not much. My recommendation is to get rich. Biddies don't care how big your face mountain is if you have money. And at the end of the day, you're not trying to be pretty. You're just trying to be smashable. Number three, your skin. Is your meat sack hideous? I'm talking pimples, moles, birthmarks, anything that doesn't make you look like an airbrush 14-year-old TikTok star. Because nowadays, your skin needs to be flawless. Celebs get it. They'll wear two pounds of makeup while preaching, you should love yourself. Like, bitch, you hated your face, so you drew on a new one. Be like if I drew abs on myself, like, check out my six pack. Oh, my bad. It's real hot out today. There we go. Speaking of drawing, I love playing this fun little game with my girlfriend where I connect all the moles on her back. <laughs> If she found out, she'd be so furious. But if your face makes children cry, you still have options. You could go the spray tan or makeup route, but if you really want to spice things up, go blackface. The only hard decision is the shade. Chocolate, mocha, ooh, is that caramel? Number four, sack of potatoes you call a body. You know the only thing worse than an eating disorder? Being fat. So it's time to get that body into shape. First, find anything they'll get that heart rate up. Whether it's Zumba, bodybuilding, watching a baby in a microwave, just make sure your heart is pumping. Next, you're gonna want to change your diet from McDonald's to 
you, looking at your disgusting self in the mirror, knowing no one loves you. Sure, your mom says it, but you know it's your brother she really cares about! And then make some chicken breast, but try to go light in the seasoning. Going too hard can result in swelling, giving you a bloated DJ Khaled-like appearance. Another one! Number five, clothes. Take off your champion hoodie and light it on fire. Your wardrobe will now consist of form-fitting clothes that make it difficult to breathe. I'm talking tight. Give the optical illusion that you have muscles. Next, you're gonna want some white sneakers. And yes, white is the dumbest color for a shoe, but it gives the impression that you're rich. And if you're rich, you're probably white. Uh, what I'm really saying is, most people think white is the superior color. Next, you're gonna want to accessorize. And nothing screams BDE like a lowercase t necklace. But I'm not religious. Doesn't matter. Religion is all about pretending to be a good person while pressing the elevator close button. Besides, you're not looking for smart chicks who can diagnose your insecurities. You're looking for broken, easily impressionable Christian bitches who don't think anal is cheating. I mean, which one do you think has no gag reflex? Yeah. Exactly. The science chick has way too much self-worth to let you skull f*** her into town syndrome. Number six, cologne. If your face burns their eyes, then let your scent be your disguise. What I'm saying is, you're gonna want to smell nice. My recommendation, bacon. Bitches love the smell of bacon. It also lets you know from the start that you're a pig. You knew this coming into the relationship. You're not allowed to be mad at me for it. But if you're Jewish and can't be wearing bacon, how about new car smell? If you want her to toss your salad, then your trunk better be smelling fresh. The point is, a good smell will trick people into thinking you're something delicious, like a fruit. Instead have something disgusting, uh, like a fruit. Okay, let's see, and there we go. Number seven, your hair. The easiest way to instantly look better is by getting a fresh haircut. And a haircut can hide your shortcomings. Big ears, grow your hair out. Small peepee, -pee, get a curly fade. Under 5'7", blow dry your hair up to make her forget you're not a real man. And if you're bald, there are options that don't involve your tallest bridge and a backflip. Like you can just get a hair transplant. And they're not just for the top of the head. You can also add hair to both your beard and eyebrows. If you're completely bald or have very little hair in the back, then just grow a beard and accept that eight nines and tens are off the table. If you're both bald and can't grow a beard, then how many backflips can you do again? So those are seven ways to fix being ugly. If I missed any, please let me know down in the comments. And just remember, you're trying to perfect the outside for what's broken on the inside. Are there things you can't joke about? No, of course not. There will always be people that get butt hurt over a joke. Recently, I made a mentally challenged joke and someone yelled at me saying, hey, what if you had a kid that came out developmentally disabled? I said, how dare you? Developmentally disabled is derived and hurtful. I prefer the term Pop-Tart. Now, if my kid was a Pop-Tart, I'd be so excited. I'd bring him to the store dressed as the Dark Knight as he's yelling, no, 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 Batman. He's knocking all the soups off the shelf, but you can't yell at him. If anything, someone will make a viral TikTok that shows how much of an awesome father I am. Uh, what I'm really saying is Pop-Tarts are a great tool in order to gain clout. It's like having a dog that wears pants. It's impossible to look away. And sure, there are some downsides, like he can't write his name without killing himself, and he can't take a piss without biting his tongue, but there are so many upsides. Think about how much easier it is to plan your day compared to a regular kid. You're never caught off guard with, Dad, come watch my soccer practice. Your kid's legs are deader than Heath Ledger in a hotel lobby. The only balls he's kicking are the ornaments on your Christmas tree. Having a Pop-Tart is like becoming rich. You can park in front of any store, get to skip the lines at Disney World, and when you're tired, you can have someone drive you around. Now, some people are going to get upset over your parenting skills, but just respond back with, hey, I don't tell you how to raise your toaster. If anything, they're jealous. They wish wish they could slap their kid in the face without having Child Protective Services called on them, but they can't. Not my fault you were cursed with the normie. And don't let the liberal media convince you they deserve the same rights as people. There's a movie called I Am Sam, based off a true story where a mentally challenged fellow is trying to gain custody of a seven-year-old girl. Spoiler alert, he doesn't. And all I can think about while watching this is, how could you root for that guy? He's retarded and wants to be responsible for a child? What do you think would happen day one? Have a good day at school. Dad, this is the post office. See you later. I find that offensive is one of the dumbest phrases in the human language. Who am I even offending? Retarded people aren't watching this video. They're too busy nibbling on their own hands. You know what offends me? The slogan autism speaks. No, it doesn't. Bleh. It's a noise, not a word. I could shake a bunch of maracas, but I'm not holding a conversation. And you know autism speaks is sponsored by Build-A-Bear? How is a child going to hug a bear whose arms are crossed the entire time? And why do you never see any of them on TV? Every show has an idiot people find funny. The Office has Kevin, Parks and Rec has Andy, The Late Show with Jimmy Fallon has... Jimmy Fallon. People love to laugh at stupid people. That's why we should televise the Special Olympics. Gary is about to set a new high dive record at two feet. Let's see if he makes it. Well, it looks like Gary is drowning. Probably shouldn't have strapped himself into the chair first. Let's see if the lifeguard is able to save and she's been knocked unconscious. Well, at least Gary will die doing what he loved. Assaulting people trying to help him. 
And Pop-Tarts can be mean, too. I used to work at a psych center with this patient named Stacy that was always biting me. Sure, I would throw away all of her food, but that's because she never put out. Why else would I work the night shift if it wasn't a smash or toaster strudel? Her mouth was always wet. How could I say no? Besides, I was a virgin and just wanted my first time to be special. <sighs> what was I talking about again? Oh, that's right. Things you can't joke about. If you get upset over a joke, then that's on you. Your triggers are your responsibility. It isn't the world's obligation to tiptoe around you. I mean, at the end of the day, don't we all wish we were more retarded? Knowing the finite nature of our existence is depressing. I feel like I'm just one can of paint away from living my life carefree. Butterfly pretty. What's the dumbest thing you've done in school? Because mine was getting both drunk and high the day before my final. It was my sophomore year of college, and I spent most of it being a straight-edged loser. Oh, alcohol is just a crutch, and I can have fun without it, I'd convince myself. Not realizing drugs are like social lube. You could raw dog and talk to a stranger, but it's way easier if you butter yourself up first. So it's the day before my English final, and I was not in a good place. My girl broke up with me a few weeks earlier, and I was still hurting. I was starting to enter that f***ing state of mind where I'm like, consequences? Who cares about those? So the night before my final, I'm walking around campus, trying to get my head right when I hear friends having a party in their dorm room. I knock on the door and they're like, shh, quiet, 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 who is it? I'm like, it's Steve. They're like, hey, homie, you can come in, but we're drinking, so I don't know if you want to get involved with this. Basically meaning it's illegal to drink on campus, so if I get caught there, I'm screwed. But I'm like, yeah, it's all good. You mind if I come in? They're like, yeah, of course. So I'm chilling for a bit, but to be honest, I'm being kind of a Debbie Downer. My buddy, seeing them in a depressed mood, offers me a beer, and I was like, Sure. Buddy's like, wait, are you serious? Bro, bro, Steve's gonna drink. For real? Yeah, buddy. About time. So they all crowd around me, like a big titty Asian at the club, waiting for me to take my first sip. I take a massive chug and immediately was like, this tastes like dog shit. Buddy's like, it's Keystone Light. What did you expect? I'm like, do you have anything to chase this with? He's like, to chase beer with? I mean, there's juice boxes in the fridge. Give me. So I continue to guzzle beer while taking little bitch sips from my juice box. Eventually, I get three beers in and I feel this wave of happiness come over me. I'd officially entered the tipsy phase and here came my first problem. Problem. Volume control. See, I already have a booming voice. Combine this with alcohol and I can get quite loud, which is not good when illegally drinking in a dorm room. So my friends are like, bro, I'm glad you're drinking with us, but you need to keep it down a little. I'm like, oh geez, I'm so sorry. You're right. Anyway, you guys wanna play Mario Kart? Like, no matter how many times I was told to keep quiet, I just get fluctuating back to way too loud. Then I get a text from my friend Tracy, and that's when I experienced the second effect of alcohol, beer goggles. My desire to pork my friend, like my Johnson, rose dramatically. You see, sober me found Tracy to be a six, but tipsy me, hmm, Tracy moved to a seven real fast. I'm like, does beer always make you this horny? And they're like, no, going through puberty makes you forever horny, but beer will make you smash people you weren't originally into. Anyway, we continued hanging out, drinking, playing Mario Kart, when my buddy starts rolling a joint. And since I was in such a good mood from the alcohol, I'm like, you mind if I smoke with you guys? And my homies just looked at each other smiling like, damn dude, we've waited all year for you to say that to us. So my buddy rolls up a fatty and we head to the woods. Being a noob who's never smoked before, I didn't know how to properly inhale. So on the first hit, I just held it in my mouth and it never got into my lungs. My buddy was like, just swallow it. And I'm like, I ain't no ho. He's like, no, j just swallow the smoke. That way you'll know it'll pass by your lungs and you won't just waste it by putting it in your mouth. So I take a hit, <sighs> swallow it. And pass it to the right. By the third hit, something in me snapped, and for whatever reason, I started pretending I was a black preacher. My brothers, we are gathered on these green pastures to smoke that sticky, icky. And if you feel the power of the Lord inside of you, give me a praise, Jesus. Pra praise praise Jesus. Jesus. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. If you feel the power of the Holy Spirit inside of you, give me a praise, Jesus. Then we see a light turn on in a house near us, and I yell, Cheese it, boys. We all book it back to campus. When we get back to the dorms, we have to check in at the front. And I'm still in character, so Saying, Hello there, children of Gowood. They're like, the fuck? And as soon as I get two steps past them, I say way too loudly, Do you think they know I was high? Buddy is like, yeah, I think they might have an idea. So I get back to my room at exactly 2.23 a.m. And this is where the story gets interesting. You see, I had my English final the next morning at 8 a.m. And when my alarm goes off at 7.45, I'm like, oh, shit. I'm still fucked up. So I go to class super paranoid that people are going to think I'm on drugs. I sit down, try not to make eye contact with anyone when the person behind me asks, do you think we need a pencil? And I was so out of it, I just said, God works in mysterious ways. The teacher eventually hands out the exam, and I'm going through it while progressively getting distracted, like, okay, how many sonnets did Shakespeare write? Is that a butterfly? <gasps> butterfly pretty. Tits, tits, focus. Focus. Eventually, I get through all the multiple choice questions, but at the end of the exam, there were two questions you needed to write out a paragraph for. And I was like, oh. Oh no. Cause zooted it or not, circling an answer is pretty straightforward. Writing out a coherent thought is much tougher. The first question was describe your experience going to a poetry reading. Now, I did go to a poetry reading, but I stayed for maybe three minutes before they asked me to leave. You see, the dude presenting had a poem titled Apple Tree. That went, my apple tree is tasty and sweet. My apple tree is ripe for the picking. My apple tree is long and hard. And I'm just laughing. 
laughing, looking around, going, we, we all know he's talking about his dick, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> anyway, even though I was kicked out, I knew exactly what my teacher wanted. The presenter's pacing, tone, inflections dramatically shaped how I viewed the poem, blah, 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 blah. The second question is where trouble started brewing. You see, it asked my experience going to a school play, and I did attend a play, but I hated it. So instead of writing what the teacher wanted to hear, I wrote how I really felt. So I started with, I saw the little shop of horrors, but they should have called it the Holocaust, because it was an atrocity. The acting was so bad, it felt like they committed a hate crime, and the plant on stage looked like a two-week-old fetus they found in the dumpster. And as I'm writing this, I'm like, oh, I shouldn't be doing this. But the drugs were just too strong, and my true feelings for the play needed to come out. Anyway, after the exam, I was like, well, I probably would have gotten a B, but maybe with the Hitler comments, I'll get a B minus. And to my surprise, I ended up getting an A minus. I'm like, how the hell? And the more I thought about it, the more it began to make sense. Like, my class was at 8 in the morning. No one ever participated. Everyone just looked down, praying the teacher would never call on them. So I think what happened was the teacher was just happy someone finally expressed themselves honestly. Either that, or maybe he got a little zooted himself. <sighs> you know what? <sighs> it did look like an aborted fetus. Families are overrated. They are. You can pick your friends, but you can't pick your family. So why are you supposed to love them unconditionally? Because you share some DNA? There's more of my DNA in a streetwalker than my cousin. Yet, I'm not inviting him to the wedding. So stop with this family comes first nonsense. Because what if they're horrible people? What if your dad is abusive, or sister steals money, or brother watches Paw Patrol with his pants off? Oh, Billy! I told you to knock! Face it, we all have terrible family members. And my family thinks that person is me. So here's a story on how I ruin Thanksgiving. Every year, my family would get together at my uncle's house for Thanksgiving. Typically, I'd spend most of the time in the basement showing my cousins the terrible videos I found on the internet. This one's called One Guy, One Jar. Oh God! Oh God, what? But this year, I was feeling extra frisky. You see, my brain was starting to develop into the entertainer you see here today. And I thought it'd be funny to act like a sassy queen. So I'm just prancing around, telling everyone how fabulous they look. Not realizing my uncle was getting furious. Eventually, my fairy energy turned his way and I said, Uncle John, your arms got so big. How did you find a t-shirt to fit those cannons? My uncle, already fuming, explodes in anger and starts screaming at me. Stop acting like a homo and be a man! And this wave of shame envelop me. I didn't even know what I did wrong or why he was angry, but being a dumb kid, I internalized it and blamed myself. Needs to say this ruined my evening, and I spent most of it turtled up, not talking to anyone. Over the course of the next year, I think about it every once in a while, and eventually my brain developed enough to piece together what actually happened. I'm like, wait, he yelled at me because he's homophobic? A child. He yelled at a child in front of everyone because he doesn't like gay people? Then, a switch flipped in my brain. I'm like, oh, if he didn't like me last year, wait till he sees me this year. So I gathered up all my money and went to the mall for a makeover. Got me some pink sneakers, bracelets, and the tightest pants my pasty ass could fit into. As I'm leaving, I pass by a store with a poster outside of it that said, Get your ears pierced here. I'm like, am I willing to mutilate myself for a joke? Yes. Yes, I am. So I got my ears pierced, and with my last $5, bought the most effeminate pair of earrings I could find. Fast forward to Thanksgiving, and as soon as I get into my mom's car, she's like, What are you wearing? I'm like, what? I'm just trying to look good. She's like, your uncle is gonna flip out. Go change. I'm like, hey, if he doesn't like it, that's on him. My body, my choice. Mom's like, ugh, whatever. And just drives to my uncle's place. As soon as we arrive, I'm gonna be honest, eh, I was getting pretty nervous. But I'd already come this far. Time to queer up or shut up. So I walk inside and begin to do the rounds. I'm like, hey, Aunt Becky, <gasps> look at your hair. It looks fantastic. Oh, bangs were such a good choice. And Billy, oh my god, look at you, you little beefcake. Eventually, I came across my uncle who has the most disgusted look on his face. Before I could even say anything, he just shakes his head and walks away. And my smile could not be bigger. I spent the next few hours chilling with my cousins, never breaking character. Eventually, they call for dinner and I skip my way over to the table. While waiting for the turkey to be brought out, I'm gonna be honest, I was getting a little sad. I was expecting to get a big reaction out of my uncle, but for the most part, he ignored me. I'm like, damn, I only got a little time left. How am I gonna to get him to notice. Oh, I know what to do. So as soon as my uncle begins to cut the turkey, I walk up to him and say, thanks for inviting us over, Uncle John. Then I gave him a little on the cheek. Immediately, he flips out. Get the f away from me, you little f Oh, I waved around the knife. I'm just pretending to be confused, like, what seems to be the problem, John? And he's screaming, you, you little f Family is trying to calm him down, but he can't be contained. My mom, being the ultimate homie, says, John, you're ruining Thanksgiving. I think you should leave. Me? Me? It's my f***ing house! You get the f*** out! Then I turn to everyone and say, geez, what's got his panties in a bunch? Which makes my uncle turn the knife towards me. I'm not even scared. I'm like, go ahead and stab me in front of everyone, you little bitch. My aunt, freaking out, goes to stop him, but trips over a chair and does that old person whimper. Ugh! 
Now it's pure chaos. Kids are crying, my aunt is moaning, uncle is waving the knife, refusing to put it down. That's when my eyes link up with my mom, who gives me a let's get the hell out of here look. So my parent and I book it out of the house and see a bunch of family members fall suit. As we were leaving, my eyes lock with my uncles through the window as I give him a little goodbye smooch. <laughs> Not surprisingly, that was the last time I was invited to Thanksgiving. And looking back on it, would I do it again? Yes. Of course I would. Matter of fact, if your anti-Semitic brother is getting married and you need a date to the wedding, I'm your man. Hey, I don't mean to interrupt, but where can I put this foreskin? Sugar is one of the most addictive substances on the planet, and just like kicking a homeless person, once you start, you just can't stop. But what is sugar? Sugar is when a glucose molecule decides to stick it in a fructose molecule, causing it to have a butt baby of sucrose. Sucrose is a simple carbohydrate, not to be confused with complex carbohydrates. You see, most people would typically group all carbs together, when they're really quite different. Simple carbs are like basic bitties. They'll give you a quick dopamine rush, and then immediately ask for a handbag. Complex carbs are like your friend's stepmom. They won't be quick, but you'd be surprised at how long they last. Sugar comes from sugar cane or sugar beets, and was originally brought to America by Christopher Columbus. Columbus, that white devil, thought, hmm, I have the sugar cane, but no slaves to grow it for me. What to do? I got it. Grow it for me, boy. And boy did he. Those slaves were used to cultivate sugar, which turned into rum, which turned into money, which turned into more slaves, which turned into, you guessed it, more sugar. And over the next couple hundred years, people realized they could add sugar to things like coffee, tea, and chocolate to make it taste better, which led to the first advertisement of Folgers. Mmm, taste the suffering. Eventually, research started to come out linking sugar to adverse health effects, but getting rid of it would affect a lot of companies' bottom line. So in the 1960s, some shady people paid Harvard scientists to downplay the link of sugar to heart disease and blame it on fat instead. That way, companies could still make massive profits and more people would die. It's really a win-win if you're a capitalist like me. But in 1972, some British scientist named John Utkin decided to grow a conscience and sound the alarm that sugar, not fat, was the greater danger to our health. The food industry responded appropriately by destroying Utkin's reputation and getting his work banned, which just goes to show the free market always works. However, eventually more research came out linking sugar to an increased risk of cancer, cavities, diabetes, obesity, basically anything that makes a person unfuckable. But by this point, the damage is already done. In America, 70% of adults are overweight and 40% are obese. I don't even know how planes can get off the ground with so many pork chops out there. Guess pigs can fly. Now in fairness, sugar isn't all bad. Your body wants about a fifth of its calories from glucose, so it's not surprising that your brain craves it. The problem is how much sugar you ingest. Like the average male only supposed to consume about 36 grams in a day. Like bish, that's less than one can of Pepsi. And that's for the day, let alone any other meal your fat ass is gonna scarf down. And you might think, oh well, the answer is simple. I just won't eat candy or drink soda. But spoiler alert, sugar is in almost everything. Peanut butter, tomato sauce, f***ing Advil has sugar in it. And just like your pastor, companies know to get you while you're young. Breakfast cereals like Cheerios are 32% sugar. Lucky Charms, 33%. Quaker Oats, oh, it has oats in it. How bad could that be? 44% sugar. How can you sell something almost 50% sugar to children and not expect some health problems? That's like bringing crystal meth cupcakes to the church bake sale, being like, why are so many kids tweaking? You see, there are only about 10 companies that own all the food and drinks in the world. And not surprisingly, the sweeter something tastes, the more likely someone will buy it. My mom fell victim to this and would always buy me things high in sugar. In her mind, she was just being a good parent, not realizing she's napalming my palate. I couldn't even drink water without getting repulsed. And being a dumb kid, I didn't think I was addicted. I was just like, oh, my taste buds must be different. You like water and broccoli, I like Skittles and Pixie Sticks. We were just built different. The only time I was like, wait, something may be wrong, was when I was chilling at my homie's house. We were in the basement practicing wrestling moves on each other. You know, typical heterosexual behavior. Anyway, we eventually both get exhausted and head upstairs for some refreshments. Normally, not I'd grab a soda, but my friend only had cranberry juice and water. So I just started chugging cranberry juice, which is wild because I find it disgusting. Like even though I didn't like the taste, my body knew there was something in this that I desired. Fast forward to college and your boy was taking a nutrition class where my teacher was like, sugar will fuck you worse than your pastor. I'm paraphrasing, but the gist was this stuff is really bad for you. So I decided to cut it out, but still crave something sweet. So what I did was transfer to crystal light, or basically fake sugar, and would slowly wean myself off of it by adding less and less to my drinks, eventually getting me used to the taste of water without being disgusted. But even after this, I still didn't think I was addicted to sugar. That was until I came home from Thanksgiving break and went out to dinner with my mom. At dinner, I decided to have a huge glass of soda, and four hours later, I had a massive craving for it. So much so, I'm like, maybe I'll just drive to CVS to pick some up. Then I'm like, bro, what is wrong with me? It's 10 at night. Why do I feel compelled to get a soda right now? And this feeling lasted for days. Like I'd be passing by 7-Eleven, like, what if, what if I just stopped in real quick? Ah, no, you crack it. Stop it. Stop it. This is the first of many 
occasions where my body would go through long stretches without sugar, eat or drink a ton of it, then go back to having withdrawals. Which kind of put other addictions in perspective. Like I definitely used to make fun of alcoholics, like, oh, not drinking 12 shots of Jaeger must be so difficult. Please tell me about your disease. But my insults were based on ignorance, because I don't have the addiction gene like many others do. Right now I have pain and sleeping pills in my medicine cabinet, yet I don't have a desire to do them. Sure, they make me feel good, but like women getting laid, I just don't have the craving for it. So much in life is about luck. Like I'm sure LeBron James has worked super hard to get where he's at, but if he was born 150 years earlier, the only free throw he'd be shooting is cotton in his master's bag. So don't feel bad if sugar or other substances have a certain amount of control over your life. Because maybe you're surrounded by fast food, or maybe you have a slow metabolism, or maybe the only way you get hard is by smelling a Krispy Kreme. I don't know you or the struggles you go through, but if you need some help quitting sugar, I do got some tips for you. Tip number one, hate yourself. When you love yourself, you start to let yourself go. That's why fat black women are so happy. And is that what you want? To love yourself? Ew. No, self-loathing is the first step to having a fit physique. And the more disgusted you are, the less likely you are to eat that bag of Skittles. Tip number two, learn how to read food labels. Starch, fruit juice, honey, and anything ending in os is basically sugar in disguise. And don't be fooled by corporate buzzwords. Just because the package says vegan and gluten-free or natural doesn't mean it's good for you. And the biggest thing to look for is added sugar. That's basically a company saying, you don't want to make this yogurt taste better? Some crack. Tip number three, go cold turkey. It's a lot easier to never do something than to do something in moderation. Think of eating healthy like like getting a handy. If you're just getting handies, it's fine. But as soon as you get that one blowy or drink that one soda, it's off the rails. You're like, this is great. Why would I ever go back to getting handies or not having sugar or whatever this analogy is about? The point is, if you never have something delicious, then you won't know what you're missing. Tip number four, replace. Like I mentioned earlier, the way I weaned myself off soda was drinking Crystal Light. Now, that's not to say these fake sugars are good for you. It's like smoking and driving instead of drinking and driving. Sure, one is better, but that doesn't mean the other one's good. One issue I have with these fake sugars is how much sweeter they are than sugar. Aspartame is 200 times sweeter, and sucralose, or Splenda, is 600 times sweeter. This causes some people, like myself, to start to crave that sweet feeling. Like recently, I brought this drink called Body Armor Light. It's 20 calories, some vitamins, and almost no sugar. So I'm thinking, oh, this has got to be good for me. But after drinking one, my body two hours later is like, more, I want more. So these sugar alternatives may be good for some, but they're not for everyone. Tip number five, seek help. Some people, especially guys, view asking for help as a sign of weakness. But really, it's a sign of maturity. It's using the tools and resources around you to help solve your problems. Because what works for you may not work for others. Like a friend of mine lost a ton of weight and credits me for insulting him as the main motivator. But calling someone chicken cutlet titties may not work for everyone. So it's best to seek out the guidance of a medical professional and come up with a plan that works best for you. Because sugar may not be your main issue. Like most addictions, it's about escaping your problems and turning to something that gives you comfort. So maybe sugar is just a coping mechanism for underlying trauma. Or maybe you just like the taste of bread. I don't know. But what I do know is heart disease is the number one killer in America. And if you think life sucks now, imagine losing your parent to a preventable disease. Yeah, talk about a bad day. Or a great day if you're trying to get an inheritance. The point is, if you care about your family, your loved ones, or yourself, then you should work on trying to curb your sugar addiction and live a healthier lifestyle. Woo! That video was a doozy. You know, I always get people being like, why don't you make longer YouTube videos? And I'm like, bro, you think animations are cheap? It's expensive. Plus, I like getting to the juice immediately. You ever watch a video that's like 10 ways to jerk off a banana and you're like a minute and a half in the video and they still haven't gotten to the first tip? Oh, really grinds my gears. So that's why I like making short little dopamine trips that are chock full of jokes and ignorance. But big changes are coming to the channel soon. Woo! your boy's developing his own little offensive merch line and I'm gonna start experimenting with some IRL videos. So we're gonna see your face? Well, you're gonna see my body and my body is f***ing nice. Mmm, tasty. You know why? Because I gave up sugar. <laughs> That's right. Brought this puppy full circle. Mmm. Puberty. The day your Johnson salutes you is the day your life changes forever. Gone are the thoughts of being an astronaut as the only rocket you want to ride is the one going in your science teacher. But how do you deal with all the changes to your body? Well, here are seven tips on how to survive puberty. Tip number one, self-discovery. Puberty is like being a janitor on Epstein's Island, where every door you open is a shocking new discovery, mostly involving bodily fluids. So it's time to learn who you are. Are you a class clown or an overachiever? A social butterfly or an introvert? A trendsetter or a basic bit? Who are you? This is the time to experiment and try new things. Don't fall into the white boy trap of eat, fap, play Minecraft, repeat. If you don't like where things are going, change. Life is like Fortnite, where you can be whoever you want while having strangers call you fag. And don't wait around for someone or something to give you purpose. Your mom didn't want to have you, and God is too busy laughing at kids with cancer. So it's up to you to decide what your life's gonna be. Number two, physical. You're gonna start to experience many physical 
changes. Your voice will get deeper, you'll start to grow facial hair, and your skin will resemble a Little Caesars pizza. The only difference between acne and your pastor is acne waits till you're 13 to come on your face. This will also be the time you start getting taller, but if you don't make it over 5'7", know you got a few options. Option 1, leg lengthening surgery, which is a real thing, you can look it up, where you can become up to 5 inches taller. And the procedure is real simple. All you do is break both femurs, <laughs> then no. drill into the thigh bone, creating a channel to put a metal rod in your leg, and then we just secure that by drilling in screws. And option two, midget wrestling. Man, they almost look like real people. Number three, sex drive. Being horny is a lot like being hungry. The only difference is where you place the cucumber. And just like being hungry, you're not thinking clearly when you're not getting stuffed. That's why I recommend all guys pound one out before making an important decision. Give yourself a little post not clarity before hitting on a girl with cold sores on her lip. And listen, everyone is going to make mistakes. Just remember, it's not a failure if you learn from it. Like the first time I kissed someone, I threw my tongue around like a Parkinson's kid trying to climb a ladder. But this taught me to be slow and gradual with my next kiss. And whatever you do, don't take sex advice from porn. Porn is like watching the circus going, oh, that's how you play with lions. Like, no, that's a professional. You're a rookie, so start with a slightly tamer kitty. Number four, personal hygiene. You used to be able to take showers once a week and spray a little Axe body spray on yourself and be good. Now, if you don't shower after gym practice, your balls will be like opening a jar of weed in the classroom. To make it simple, I have a patented shave trim tut strategy. You're going to want to shave your balls, your back, and that Anthony Davis eyebrow. You're going to want to trim your nose hairs, your beard, and those Wolverine claws. And you're going to want a touch of deodorant and cologne. Just remember, if you want to smash a kitty, make sure your balls are pretty. Number five, rebel. Part of going through puberty and becoming a teenager is rebelling against authority. Are you seriously going to let your parents tell you what to do? Your dad's a driver for FedEx and your mom had you in the back of a Beyonce concert. They're masters at making poor decisions. So be a risk taker and start telling everyone, no. Homework? No. Traffic laws? No. Inevitable early death? No. Don't let anyone tell you what to do. Be a master of your domain and stroke your large ego in front of them. Not breaking eye contact, only getting faster and faster. Number six, mood swings. Puberty is an emotional roller coaster. One moment you'll be happy, the next you'll be, I will stab you in the throat! This is due to changing hormone levels causing mood swings. And it's important to reflect on situations you got emotional and think, what could I have done better? Like one day, you're going to find your friend's mom on OnlyFans, and this is where the true test begins. Is it funny? Yes. Do you want to show everyone? Of course. But if you're a really good friend, you'd keep it to yourself and donate $60. That way your friend gets that new game he was waiting for, and you get to play a game of your own. Number seven, peer pressure. To it, no balls. Will be a phrase you hear a lot in your life, but it's important to weigh the pros and cons of any given situation. Puff, puff, pass, sure. Drink, drive, glass, Ugh, not so much. Billy, no! And don't blame your friends for peer pressure. Blame your simple monkey brain. You see, the parts of your brain responsible for risk assessment and planning ahead are still developing. This is why teenagers are more likely to be involved in high-risk behavior, like drinking and driving or raw-dogging your second cousin. You just wanted your friends to think you're cool, and I get that. But if shit goes south, you'll be the one dealing with the consequences. Billy, aren't you happy you survived? <laughs> Bonus tip, and this might be the most crucial one of all, dating. You're going to start developing what science refers to as feelings. And with feelings will come crushes. And with crushes will come rejection. And if you get rejected, that's okay. Just try not to get into the mindset of, If I can't have you, no one can! Because that's not a place you want to be. Remember, you're not going to vibe with everyone. And there will always be other people out there willing to deep throat your gym dog. So those are all my tips on how to survive puberty. If I miss any, please let me know down in the comments. And just remember, puberty is like Asian parents where it's going to hit you no matter what. Dating sucks, and not in a good way. It usually revolves around endlessly swiping, finger crossing you don't get sent dick pics. What the hell? You said you were a girl, not one of those new age girls. But actually going on a date can be even worse. So here's the list of my four worst dates. Starting off with the cripple. I went on a date with a girl who was in a wheelchair. It was a blind date, and the person setting it up did not tell me she was in a wheelchair. I'm not even saying it'd be a deal breaker, but you think I'd get a heads up before I take her parasailing saying, relax, bitch, you can't get paralyzed twice. Anyway, we ended up meeting up at a bar, and one of the first things she says to me is, you don't mind? that my lower body is paralyzed? And my response was, well, your mouth still works, right? Needless to say, she got all bent out of shape about it. I mean, not as bent as her crippled body, but you know what I mean. My second date was with the home wrecker. I was working at IHOP at the time and a girl left me her number, which personally, I thought was a really good sign because I looked disgusting. My hair was a mess, had dark circles under my eyes, and I was wearing a blue apron that very clearly had butter on it. I'm like, damn, if this chick was willing to smash while I look like this, wait till she sees me all dolled up. So we meet up at the bar and we're talking for about 10 minutes or so when she says, okay, I have something to tell you. I said, stid her kids. She goes, what? I'm like, well, usually when a girl says that, she's about to reveal either she has an STD or kids. She goes, neither. I'm like, oh, great. Then what is it? She says, so I'm actually married, but I really like you. And I said, oh... 
so you're a whore. Needless to say, she didn't take it very well. But in my defense, saying you want to be with other guys while married is a pretty whorey thing to do. My third date was with the third wheel. I met this fine-ass honey named Melissa on Bumble and invited her out for some drinks. She says she wasn't much of a drinker and recommended a restaurant instead. I'm like, sure. So we meet up and we're about 20 minutes in waiting for our food when a guy comes over to our table hysterically crying, saying, Melissa, it doesn't have to be like this. Let's just go back to how it was before. Melissa says, it's over, Brian. Just let it go. And this guy just keeps crying and asking for forgiveness in the middle of the f***ing restaurant. I never felt so uncomfortable. Like, if I was at a bar, I think I'd just leave. But I was hungry and wanted my steak. Now, in retrospect, I should have just stayed quiet. But because I'm an idiot, I decided, hmm, I can solve this. So I say, listen, man, you're coming off a little rapey right now. Brian says, rapey? I'm not f***ing rapey. Then Melissa says, what are you talking about? He didn't rape me. Now I'm backpedaling, saying, no, 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 that's not what I meant. I'm saying he's not taking no for an answer, which comes off kind of rapey. And now both Melissa and Brian are against me, saying, I shouldn't joke about stuff like that. And I'm losing my mind, thinking, how am I the bad guy here? I just wanted some steak and a little makeout sesh. So I just got up and left. And she's screaming, where are you going? And all I'm trying to do is not make eye contact with everyone in the restaurant that's f***ing staring right at me. <laughs> my fourth date was the masochist. I met this chick named Stacy in the bedding department at Bed Bath & Beyond. She was covered in tattoos, which personally, I find really attractive. Because it screams they're probably into kinky stuff. So I spit some game and ask her off some drinks. She agrees and we meet up at the local brewery. Almost immediately, I could tell this girl was a little off. Like all of her conversation topics involved violence. I'll give you an example. She asked if I could punch any celebrity in the face, who would I punch in the face? And I said, ooh, that's a good one. Um, probably Gwyneth Paltrow. Mostly because she has the audacity to sell a candle that smells like her so then I said to her, who would you punch in the face? And what do you think her answer was? Go ahead and pause the video and write it down in the comments. Because I'm telling you, you won't even be close. She says, Danny DeVito. I'm like, jeez, you must really hate Always Sunny. She goes, no, I love that show. So I'm like, then why Danny? She said, because it'd be easy. And I wouldn't just punch him. No, i back him into an alley saying, this is it, Danny. You're about to die. He'd probably freak out saying, well, why are you doing this? That's when I take out my knife and start pacing closer to him. His panic will only increase as he begins to back up. Then I'd say, you know what? This isn't fair. Here. And I toss him my knife. Then as soon as he grabbed it, I take out my gun and be like, no, 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 Danny, give it back. Then as he slides the knife back, I show him, no bullets were in the gun. That knife was your only chance, Danny, and you just slid it back to me. And as she's talking, I'm looking at her like, bro, this bitch is insane. So of course, I did the only logical thing. Invite her back to my place to smash. Crazy is my Viagra, and once I have blood flowing in my Johnson, I'm not thinking correctly. So this is where the story gets even worse. The lights are off and we're going at it, when she starts clawing at my back, like really digging her nails into there. For the first few seconds, I'm like, oh, all right. But the pain was just too much to bear, and eventually I yelled, stop it, stop it. I turned on the lights because I couldn't tell if there was sweat or blood all over my back, and it turns out it was blood, along with some fresh Wolverine claw marks. So I'm standing there, naked, just throwing tissues at my back as she's looking at me like I'm the weird one. She says, so we gonna keep doing this or? I'm like, are you fucking serious? My back is currently menstruating and I don't want my room to look like a crime scene. Get out. So what did I learn from all these dates? Well, one, never go on a blind date with someone without seeing a picture first. Two, always meet up at a bar. That way you have a quick getaway in case things go south. And three, if you're gonna smash a chick you know is insane, make sure to tie your hands up first. Drinking and driving, getting your RA pregnant, watching hentai with the door unlocked, there are plenty of ways to ruin your life in college. So here's a story about the biggest screw up I've ever met, named Jimmy. Jimmy was basically Steve-O without all the fame and money. He was the ultimate attention-seeking who would do anything in front of a crowd. He climbed fire escapes, punched himself in the balls, got suplexed on beer pong tables, anything to get a reaction out of the people. And right before a stunt, he would always yell, to the moon! Not sure why, but with Jimmy, I learned not to ask questions and just accept the craziness. Anyway, one day I'm hanging out with Jimmy and a few peeps and I start rolling some weed. I made a little line with a credit card and I'm about to put in the blunt when Jimmy says, how much would you pay me if I snorted that? And my eyes lit up. I'm like, uh, for the whole line? I'll buy you a bottle of Jack Daniels. The problem was I was too excited and Jimmy started to have second thoughts. But I knew Jimmy didn't care about the bottle. He just wanted the attention. So I start chanting, Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy. And now we're all chanting, Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy. I see Jimmy crack a little bit of a smile and he says, to the moon. Then he puts one hand on the side of his nose, bends over and takes a huge rip. <laughs> Immediately, Jimmy was f***ed up. He's just moaning, oh, oh. <laughs> I'm dying. Jimmy keeps trying to blow it out, but he put dry plant matter in a wet nasal cavity. It ain't coming out. So he walks into the bathroom, puts his wallet and phone on the counter, and steps right into the shower. Fully clothed, he's just moaning into the shower head. Oh. <laughs> 
And I don't know who's crying more, Jimmy from pain or me from laughter. Another time I'm hanging out in the dorm with some peeps when Jimmy comes barreling in. He's like, guys, guys, have you ever tried a gravity bong before? We're like, no. He's like, well, I'm about to blow your mind. I need a two liter bottle and a bucket filled with water. I'm like, what do you need a bucket for? He's like, no time, fill up a bucket and find me a two liter. So I get some water, but the only two liter we had was an unopened bottle of soda. He's like, you gotta empty this first. I'm like, dude, I'm not just gonna pour out a full two liter. He's like, fine, and starts chugging it, stopping periodically to burp and moan. He gets through about 90% of it, and I could tell he's in pure agony. So I just pour out the rest. He's like, oh, okay. Okay, we're almost there. So he cuts off the bottom of the bottle, burns a hole in the cap, and stuffs it with a bowl. I'm looking at this contraption, having no faith it would work, but as soon as Jimmy lit the bowl, I was mesmerized. Smoke begins to fill the bottle as Jimmy looks at us and says, To the moon. Then he takes off the cap, inhales, and blows smoke all around the room. Now our dorm is covered in a thick fog, and everyone begins to panic. Jimmy's coughing uncontrollably, and I'm like, Guys, what are we gonna do? Hearing all the commotion, the RA comes and knocks on our door. Jimmy, with limited lung capacity, is like, Oh, tits, I can't get caught. I'm still on probation. So he opens opens a window, and I'm thinking he's trying to aerate out the place. Nope. He just starts punching the screen till there's enough space to fit through and jumps out. He crashes a story below into a bush and starts wailing. Oh! Roommate lets the RA in, who immediately walks to the window to see where all the screaming's coming from. While he was distracted, I sneak out, and as I'm exiting the building, I still remember hearing Jamie's wails in the distance. <laughs> Somehow, Jimmy doesn't get expelled for this, and a week later, I bump into him in the cafeteria. He's got a walking boot on, and before I could even ask about his injuries, he says, Hey, do you still have the two-liter? I'm like, the one we cut in half? Yep, I think so. He's like, good, bring it over my place tonight at eight. So I go over Jimmy's place later that evening, thinking he was just gonna make another gravity bong, but it turns out, he had grander plans. First, Jimmy takes the two-liter and starts stuffing the opening with cigarettes. I'm talking like 40 cigarettes. Then he places it on a table next to a beer can, a bowl, and a little line of Coke. I'm like, Jimmy, uh, this might be a little much, uh, even for you. He's like, don't worry, bro. I'll be fine. I'm like, dude, mixing beer, weed, coke, and cigarettes seems like a really bad idea. He's like, don't forget about peyote. I'm like, peyote? He's like, yeah, I put peyote in one of the cigarettes. You mean the shit that makes you see spirit animals? He's like, yeah, I'm looking to get twisted. I'm like, dude, seriously think about what you're doing for a sec. But before he could respond, people start chanting, Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy. Jimmy, Jimmy with a huge smile on his face, yells, to the moon! Then he snorts the coke, takes a hit from the bowl, shotguns the beer, and starts lighting the cigarettes. He gets made Maybe two puffs in before dropping it, coughing violently. <laughs> Everyone's cheering, and I'm thinking disaster averted. That was until Jimmy started talking in tongues. He's just like, blah, 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 blah. At first we thought he was kidding, but it became clear he was actually losing his mind. I walk over to him to see if he was alright, but he just pushes me aside and bolts out the house. With his walking boot still on, he runs into the street yelling nonsense. People at the party are freaking out, yelling, Jimmy! Jimmy, what are you doing? Eventually a car comes and Jimmy jumps up on the hood. The driver panics and floors it in reverse, causing Jimmy to fall back first onto the concrete. That's when I was like, fuck this, and called 911. Paramedics come, and as they're taking Jimmy away, I'll never forget what he said to me. <laughs> so whatever happened to Jimmy, well, I have good news. He ended up turning his life around and is now a guidance counselor. <laughs> I'm kidding. He's dead. But some people need a happy ending, you know? He's okay? Oh, thank goodness. You know me, not being able to deal with reality. The funny part was, he made a full recovery from this incident, and ended up dying from a drunk driver hitting him. Yeah. Talk about irony. But I guess when your entire life is a car crash, it isn't too surprising. Anyway, the lesson you should take from this video is doing reckless things for attention is a recipe for disaster. So if you're struggling with destructive tendencies, it's important to seek help. But if you're gonna do it anyway, then at least have it on film. To the moon, buddy.